invested $10,000 in the ETF, QQQ, here's what it looks like, right? So here's your top one, two, three, four, five, six. Here's the top eight companies in there, right? So if you invested $10,000 in QQQ, you'd have $1,000 in Microsoft because this is the, it goes from biggest position down. Right, so Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, NVIDIA, Facebook, Tesla, and then Pepsi are the top eight positions. So maybe 70% of your money will go in these eight companies, and then the remainder of the money will be spread out through the rest of the stocks inside of the portfolio. Here's what I want you to understand about that. When you invest in QQQ, You understand that Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon are the drivers of the ETF. This is something that people don't always talk about. When they tell you get the ETF, you got to look inside the ETF and see what is the top 10 positions. And then from that, what are the top three positions? Because these three positions are typically the drivers of the ETF. Meaning, as these three positions move, it's a good chance that the ETF moves. So why is QQQ down so much? Because Microsoft is down, Apple is down, well, Apple was down, Google was down, Amazon was down last year. This is why QQQ was down so much. You feel me? So when you inside of your ETF, you want to find out exactly what's driving the ETF so you can know. Now, let's double down on this. Let's say you don't like QQQ, but you wanted to find another ETF that had Google, Apple, Microsoft. What you would do is say ETF that have Microsoft in it, ETF that have Google in it, ETF that has Amazon in it, ETF that has NVIDIA in it. And so now inside of those ETFs, now you can navigate ETFs that have different specific stocks in it. Now, some people will often get inverse ETFs confused. So SQQQ and TQQQ, they're cousins to QQQ. One of them goes up when QQQ goes up and one of them goes up when QQQ goes down. These indexes, ETFs, are wrapped up with futures and other options contracts inside of them. They're never made to hold for the long term. God damn, we cooking already. Somebody online is trying to charge you $19.97 for this, man. He's trying to tell y'all this. All right, so let's break down this one. Let's break down the VOO, right, of the SPY, right? So let's say you had the SPY. Let's say you invested $10,000 in this. Here we go. Now, this is spread out over 500 companies, right, because this one will track the SPY. So if you had $10,000 in it, $600 will go to Apple, $533 will go to Microsoft, $311 will go to Google, $260 will go to Amazon, $171 will go to Microsoft, so on and so forth. These are the top nine. Now, trap, that ain't $10,000. Of course it's not. Remember, the fund is broken down into 500 companies. So if we're putting every company at a dollar amount, when you look at the VOO, what you want to look at now is the percentage that the company has inside of the ETF. Golly, man. This is a goddamn on masterclass again. This is a masterclass again. This should be a challenge or something, right? Golly. So what happens is this, man. Now, well, Trap, why did QQQ have bigger? Well, because QQQ doesn't have 500 companies in it. The SPY or the VOO is going to have 500 companies in it. So that $10,000, 600 of it went to Apple. They have some companies inside of the the VOO that may be getting $3 of your your $10,000. Right? But we break it down into a percentage. Right? And once once you break it down into a percentage, now you know what percentage of your money. So if you look at the VOO and it's, Apple is at 8%, then you know that 10%, 8% of that $10,000 is an investment in Apple. Uh, that's how your money is spread out. But you're essentially invested in the fund itself. All right, so I just want to break that down for y'all right quick, man, because I know I got some ETF lovers, some index fund lovers, and I wanted you to see how exactly your money is broken down on a percentage basis 
inside of the ETF on a percentage basis inside of the ETF. Let's go, man. Golly, man. <laughs> that boy is good. All right, man. <laughs> Oh, they should never give me that one. That's my favorite one. I ain't gonna lie. I think that's probably my favorite one. All right, man. So now let's take, let me take you on another journey, right? Let me show you how you can find the perfect stock. Dave, just throw that graphic on the screen right quick. Let them get it. Let them get all of this big Mac. This is good, bro. We are the gate firing. Let's go to the board early, right? Let's look at this. So we're going to draw a funnel, right? And what we're going to do is say, okay, first thing, my, you first things first, we put buy at the bottom. Why is buying this at the bottom? Because there's a formula that must take place before we buy. There's a formula that must take place before we buy. First thing, is this in my circle of competence? How do I know? Do I understand the business? Thank you for the super chat, family. Second thing, stability filter. Is the company in financial good shape? Is, is the company financially in good shape? Now, that one may vary depending on where you at. It is okay to invest in a company that is not profitable if they can give you a profitability date and you see specific enhancement happening inside the business. What is those specific enhancements we're looking for, Trap? Okay, is revenue growing? Is earnings growing? How much debt are they taking on? If they're taking on a lot of debt, where is it going? Are they, is debt now Going down. What phase of the business are they in? Are they in a growth phase? Or are they in a stability phase? Like for me, a company that's in a growth phase, it's okay if that company has debt, but now I need a profitability date. Or I need to see how are you going to plan on getting away with that debt. If it's a company like AT&T, I don't want no part of you no more because you got too much debt. And because you don't have no growth in you, it's going to take you forever to get rid of that. So question, I need you to write down. Homework. If the company has a lot of debt, what phase of the business is the company in? Yeah, that was, that was, that was no board, yo. That was no board. Nick, listen. You feel me? All right, let's go a little further. Why moat? Can it survive for a long time? Meaning, does the company have some type of competitive advantage that sets me apart from its peers? Do we have that competitive advantage? Do we have it? It must have it. It must have it. All right? Price. Is the share price cheap? Now, you got to go back. If you're in Travis Anonymous or if you took the Wall Street Trapping course, you understand how to find enterprise value. If not, go back to episode 24. We talked about how to use P.E. ratios. And the last thing we do is buy. As we move forward, I want to show you something. Even in a buying and selling process, you must be able to find a risk between the financial risk and the emotional risk. So I want to show you something. When we're looking at financial risk, we want to ask yourself a couple of questions. What is my time horizon? What is my age? What is my tax bracket? And ultimately, in building out this portfolio, do you have to live off a portion of the portfolio or can it just appreciate? This is important. Time horizon. How long am I expecting this to be here? Age. How old am I? Tax bracket. Why is tax bracket important, Trap? Because everybody's tax bracket affects how they invest. Right? Your tax bracket affects how you invest. A person investing $10,000 a month 
is it a different tax bracket than a person who can invest $1,000 a month? I'm not saying either one is better, but the tax bracket now talks about how you allocate money to your portfolio. Golly, man. Did they teach y'all this in finance class in college? <laughs> All right, next, we're going to talk about emotional risk tolerance, right? Emotional risk tolerance is a thing. There must be a balance between the two. We must ask ourselves this question, y'all, and I'm being real. Are we letting the data dictate our investment decisions or are we letting our emotions do it? Emotional investing will cost us a lot of money. I needed to hit that ball after that one, you heard me? Emotional investing will cost us a lot of money, y'all. I'm trying to save somebody. All right, so here's how we're going to distinguish some questions to ask ourselves when it comes to the emotional risk tolerance. Now, I know this is going to be a, this is something you ain't, I, I ain't never even taught this before. That's the crazy part about trapping tools, bro. Like, I be thinking about some of the stuff I be saying, I be like, dog, this is a whole, like, webinar. This will be a webinar. I ain't never even taught this before. Watch this. Emotional risk tolerance, one. All right, I'm going to give y'all 30 seconds to go get your pen and paper. First of all, it's a requirement. It should be a requirement. Watch this. Let's write this down. Are you aggressive when the market is well? Are you aggressive when things are bad? Write that down. Are you aggressive when the market is well? Are you aggressive when things are bad? So why do we ask this question? Well, when the market, when the market is doing good, do you find places to be aggressive at? Right? Because there's people who when the market is doing good, they're like, you know what? I'm going to just sit on my hands. I ain't going to do nothing. I'm going to play a conservative. Then there are people when the market is in bad times, they're aggressive. And there are some people during bad times that are conservative. We talking about erat. We talking about uh, rationalizing and putting a face on your emotional risk tolerance. We talking about putting a face on it. We talking about dressing it up, dressing it up and make it real for me. That went over y'all head. That went over their head. They went over. They went over their head. Can that went over their head? They don't even know. Come on, man. Y'all know future profits. Stop playing. Right. Next. Are you conservative when things are good? Are you conservative when things are bad? Watch this. We're going to do a little deeper. Go a little deeper. Do you panic in tough situations? We're talking about, we're talking about helping you balance your emotional risk tolerance here. We're talking about giving you an identity. All right? Because some people, when the market is, like, in tough situations in the market, you're like, I don't know what to do. But if some people is, bye, I don't care. I don't care. All right? Watch this. Can you remain calm? Here's my question. Does data direct you or does emotion drive your investment decisions. We at least want to be somewhere around 70-30. Anything beyond a 30% emotional risk tolerance, you got work to do. I want you to understand something. The expected value, watch this, y'all. This is about to be good. This is about to be good for y'all. Ooh, this is about to be good. I like when I come up with these on the fly. Watch this. Every day as an investor, it is your goal to translate investment opportunities 
into investment probabilities. This is where the true skill is at. This did. <laughs> this. This did advertise it. Two of the about man, bring the bill. All right, let's say it again. Every day, as an investor, you must translate investment opportunities into probabilities. This is where the true skill is at. Let's break this down. Watch this. Let's think about a lottery ticket for a second. Let's think about a lottery ticket for a second. The value of a lottery ticket is in the potential that you can hit the jackpot. The probabilities of you winning is where the investor judges the investment. All right, let's dig in again. Let's dig in it again. Let's dig in it again. The value, the expected value of the lottery ticket is in the potential that you can hit the jackpot. Right? But watch this. The potential in you hitting the jackpot has nothing to do with the probabilities. The emotion of you seeing the jackpot number is what makes you say I want to play that. The probability defines how much you as an investor are willing to make in that investment. God! Yeah. 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 All right, man. We're going a little further. Listen, we're going a little further. We're going to go a little further. I want to drive in on this because now we doing this. We are now making you an investor. So the first thing we did was give you financial risk. And then we gave you the emotional risk tolerance. And now we're painting it out for you. 